So welcome everyone. Welcome to the to our to our webinar. Um, we're really excited to have you, um, you know, with us today um, to present, you know, this joint uh, joint work between the Digital Cooperation Organization, um, you know, DCO and and White Shield, um, looking at the metaverse um, and the policy implications uh, for a new digital frontier. Um, we've got a great uh, great uh, lineup of um, uh, panelists. Uh, to walk you through um, and discuss uh, the results of the paper um, and to have a discussion about some critical uh, metaverse topics, um, if you will. Um, but maybe first, before I introduce our, 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 our fine our fine panelists, maybe just a few you know logistics um, you know you know pieces, if you will. Um, so as you know, that a lot of the work in this discussion will be centered around um, this jointly um, authored white paper, um, if you will. Um, you can actually access uh, the white paper itself. So we've got the QR code. Um, you can see it at least on the bottom left um, you know, of your screen. Uh, that'll take you to the DCO website library. We'll be able to access it, you know, download it, and, and obviously read it very, very thoroughly, as, 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 as will be good for you to do. Um, second, uh, during uh, the, the webinar itself, we'd ask you to participate to show at least a small poll um, looking at some of the challenges um, of the webinar itself. And so, you know, we'll, we'll post that up um, to get a little bit as well of your, your, your direct feedback, looking at some of the challenges in terms of the, the metaverse development, if you will. Um, third uh, piece is the webinar will be recorded um, and that um, the full, uh, you know, the full uh, YouTube video itself will be available on DCO's um, website, I'm sure shared, you know, through the, through, um, you know, social media, both in terms of DCO and as well, um, you know, through, uh, through White Shield as well. And then finally, at the end, of course, we don't want, you know, just in terms of discussion of the panelists, um, but to have a Q&A session at the end um, where everyone can submit um, any sorts of questions that they have via the, you know, the Zoom chat itself. Um, as I said, we're quite excited to have you here, talk about this, um, you know, topic, present um, at least the, the some initial thoughts, you know, and ideas, and hopefully it'll, it'll spur some, you know, good discussion, I would say, between the, the, the panelists and then um, obviously ourselves in terms of the attendees with some nice questions. Um, so let me introduce at least the the you know the the panelists themselves. Uh, so very quickly, uh, Tom Flynn, um, partner at at White Shield, um, White Shield itself, a public policy you know firm, um, with one of the facets being the intersection between you know digital analytics and policy area. Um, and that's why we're so thrilled as well to, to to work together with our colleagues you know from DCO um, about the paper itself. We've got Ahmed Binder, who's a policy innovation um, director uh, at DCO itself. Um, so, so, so Ahmed has been serving in this particular capacity, spearheading digital policy initiatives and supporting kind of this cooperation among the DCO members themselves. A strong, obviously, expertise in terms of policy, you know, regulation, um, with a strong focus in terms of technology. Um, actually, I think uh, Ahmed, you've got a, in terms of a technical background too, in terms of master's degree in you know telecommunications um, and electronics engineering, if I remember correctly, in terms of the bachelor. So, so bring I think both in terms of the policy side, the cooperation, and then you know the technical expertise, um, which is quite um, which is quite great. Um, then we have Dr. Christina um, Yang Zhang. Um, who's actually CEO um, at the Metaverse Institute uh, itself. Um, so brings Dr. Christina, of course, brings you know very very strong um, expertise overall in the field of you know Metaverse uh, policy development um, in Metaverse and even the history and development of Metaverse. So we're looking quite forward to hear you know her insights um, across multiple topics. And then Philippe Nahas, um, partner as well at White Shield, um, and head of actually White Shield's at digital practice. I'm an expert, particularly in linking, I think, in terms of the digital side and actually the digital and technical development um, with the with the uh, with the policy sphere and, and policy development um, itself. So, so overall, maybe just a briefing very quickly about the the, the session itself. Um, so Ahmed will present, um, you know, to us um, kind of an overview about the the, the the paper itself. You know, defining the metaverse. You know, kind of some core core attributes in terms of the metaverse, its development, some of the challenges, and then use cases to you know to situate us. I'd say about about the discussion itself, and then we'll cover some specific topics. You know, related related to that um, in terms of arriving at you know kind of human centric metaverse itself. You know, looking at some particular use cases, the tech in infrastructure for the metaverse, and then how we can shape the metaverse, you know, collectively itself. And then we'll take some QA at the end. Um, but maybe without further ado, I'd, I'd pass it over to you, Ahmed, and you can you know, come here. Thank you, Tom. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for introducing me, Tom. I'm Ahmed Binder. I'm the Policy Innovation Director at the Digital Cooperation Organization. Um, and may I request uh, the slides to be on, uh, please, for the deck? Excellent, excellent. 
Thank you very much. Um, so let me start by introducing the DCO. Uh, DCO is a global intergovernmental organization that is headquartered in Riyadh uh, that aims to enable digital prosperity uh, for all by accelerating the inclusive and sustainable growth of the digital economy. Uh, DCO firmly believes uh, in the key role of transformative technologies like metaverse towards building a sustainable, safe, and inclusive digital future for all. Uh, next slide, please. Our current membership includes 15 member states uh, that are spread across Africa, Middle East, Asia, and the Europe. And we have a growing network of observers and knowledge partners uh, that represent the private sector, international organizations, NGOs, academia, and civil society. Uh, next slide, please. So, okay, so today we are talking about the metaverse. Uh, I, think, I think to have a common understanding of what metaverse is, so metaverse in, in simple terms is a combination of immersive digital spaces or worlds where humans can interact, play, work, create, and socialize using their virtual digital embodiments called avatars. Um, the, 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 there are uh, evolutions, constant evolutions around, uh, around these aspects that we have discussed, uh, but so far um, what we are aware of in terms of metaverse uh, is these, uh, are these aspects that I have just uh, explained. So metaverse being one of the frontier digital technologies is showing great economic potential. With investments over $120 billion in 2022, the metaverse economy is estimated to grow from the current $84 billion to over $5 trillion by 2020, 2030. And there are the, uh, these are conservative estimates. There are estimates that would take it up to $13 trillion, for example. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I will walk you through some of the key highlights of our white paper. As Tom has mentioned, uh, DCO has jointly uh, uh, published a white paper uh, in collaboration with, uh, with White Shield, uh, and that would be the core of our discussion today. Um, uh, the link is provided, uh, so I, um, uh, I really urge you to download the white paper and the details will be in there. Um, so in our white paper, we first took an attempt to defining the metaverse, since there are multiple definitions going around due to the ongoing evolution and complexity of this concept. Uh, our definition takes into consideration the historical evolution of the web through the lens of three distinct waves of technological development. Web 1.0 is the first one that emerged in the early 90s, and this is called the read-only web. It focused on the static consumption uh, of the content that was produced predominant, predominantly by companies and institutions. So you would, you would open the web pages and then you would uh, get the information from them. Uh, there was no interaction involved. Web 2.0, which emerged in 2000s, uh, can be termed as participative social web. It emphasizes the user-generated user content and social networking and the likes of Facebooks and YouTubes and, and all the interactive platforms that you can see uh, are, are clubbed under this wave. Uh, the third wave, Web 3.0, which is now under progress, uh, is the third wave of this evolutionary journey. It is characterized by the convergence of emerging technologies, uh, bridging, uh, bringing uh, decentralization and AI-powered personalization personal, personalization for the users. Uh, so in, in the context of these three uh, technological waves, we define metaverse as a natural extension of this web tree uh, with a specific focus on enhancing the immersive aspect of the user experience through, for example, the technologies like AR and VR and digital, and digital twin for industrial uses specifically. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. So the metaverse is a complex layered system that enables users to interact, create, and collaborate in a virtual ecosystem. Uh, we have tried uh, to map some of these layers and their functionalities in our paper, uh, which you can see on your screens. So the base layer, as expected, would consist of hardware, devices, and network infrastructure. The second layer corresponds to the familiar TCP IP layer of the internet. The third layer encompasses the peer-to-peer -peer protocols for the decentralized operation of, of the Web3 and Metaverse. The fourth layer in, uh, implements the consensus protocols. The fifth layer would be uh, for executing uh, interactions and transactions like digital payments. And the sixth layer, uh, being the primary user interface, would host a whole bunch of Metaverse applications on it. Next slide, please. 
So here we've uh, mentioned some notable use cases of metaverse and their transformative potential across various sectors, spanning from education, healthcare, entertainment, commerce, labor, and industrial production. Industrial production, for example, can be made safer and more efficient using the digital twin technology, uh, which is the constituent, constituent technology of the metaverse. Next slide, please. But this transformation comes at a cost. There are complexities and concerns that must be addressed to ensure a safe, sustainable, and inclusive metaverse for all. These complexities stem from a few things, our identity in the metaverse, the ownership and usage of digital goods and services in the metaverse, the way users transact and interact in the metaverse, and from various enablers of our collective experience in the metaverse. Some of, some of the key challenges um, include digital identity, property rights and ownership, transacting and exchanging, accountability, security, interoperability, and digital inclusion, uh, to name a few. Next slide, please. So to address these complexities, uh, in our paper, we make numerous policy recommendations. These policy recommendations could be clubbed under two broad categories. So category one are on those that affect the wider ecosystem that enables the development and innovation around the metaverse. For example, the need for broader government support and the room for regulatory experimentation through sandboxes, etc. Korea is a good example of this. The government has announced there a range of initiatives to foster an enabling ecosystem for metaverse. These initiatives include, for example, creation of a metaverse academy, provision of dedicated facilities and metaverse hubs to support uh, specialized companies and facilitation of core, uh, core immersive content and the technology development. Category two includes the recommendations that impact the user's immersive experience within the metaverse. This includes the need for, for example, rights protecting and safe use of the metaverse. The paper also uh, discusses some of the potential and current limitation and challenges that are associated to specific metaverse use cases, and then presents policy considerations for each use case. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, uh, with an aim to understand on how policymakers can shape a human-centric, accessible, sustainable, and inclusive metaverse, the paper suggests a range of guiding principles that should be taken into consideration. Uh, these includes, uh, for example, a human-centric and inclusive approach to policymakers, policy uh, where the private entities and developers should be included from day one, uh, avoiding excessive regulation uh, of the emerging technologies, uh, advocacy for, for global standards and standardization, uh, rethinking of the traditional top-down approach towards policymaking, and uh, uh, and, and, and the evidence-based approach that has been taken in the previous rounds of technologies. So with this, um, uh, uh, the quick summary of, of our work at the Metaverse comes to an end. And now I pass the floor back to Tom uh, to take the discussion further and uh, uh, we'll chip in further as the questions come. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, thanks for that. I think uh, that the very concise and succinct, you know, summary of, of where we're at and to provide us, I think, with some baseline, um, I think, for, you know, for the discussion, um, you know, moving forward. Um, maybe, Dr. Christina, though, to turn to you, you know, I hear at least, you know, from my perspective, yes, you know, Medverse is going to be large, you know, a huge economy, you know, different set, you know, multiple different layers in terms of its development. But but maybe even practically, how, how do we actually know when we arrive, you know, at the metaverse itself? You know, is it, do you see it as a, you know, big inflection point, a turning point? Are we going to gradually, you know, arrive in terms of the metaverse? It, it'd be great to hear a bit of the experience that you, that at least you're from your expertise as to when we'll actually know and kind of realize, you know, that transition, if you will, to, to becoming in the metaverse. And, and then second, this idea about shaping the metaverse itself. I mean, we all know from different technologies that technology um, isn't necessarily inherent, we don't necessarily good, nor is it necessarily bad, if you will. How can we, as Ahmed very nicely mentioned, you know, confront different challenges or address just different topics, you know, to shape and to direct, you know, this human-centric metaverse? Um, it'd be great to hear your, your, your thoughts on these two pieces. Thank you, Tom, for that very interesting questions. And firstly, I would like to congratulate both DCO and the White Shield for such really insightful white paper I have write a whole one, and uh, I find it's really, really useful. So I, I, I think you guys putting a lot of really great, you know, analysis on how to make it work for government worldwide, which is very much needed at this moment. 
because as Ahmed, you have rightly pointed out, even for the definition of the metaverse, there are so much debate going on forever. So I think it's quite good to start with definition to see what is really metaverse for different governments, entities, etc. And go back to the question from Tom. Um, we all know that the metaverse is nothing new, as already pointed out in your white paper, and it started in 1992 with Neil Stevens' uh, snow crash. And the world's first metaverse platform is called Second Life, which was launched in 2003 by the San Francisco-based company called Linden Lab. So actually, um, the metaverse we're talking about now is perhaps is already the second wave of the metaverse, which is very much like, um, you know, the major milestone is when Facebook changed the name into Meta in 2021. And then worldwide, we start to see extraordinary excitement of investments, energies coming to the place and try to really looking at what are the effective use case to bring benefits and positive impact to the wider society. So I think if in the future, we can have a time to really make it more mainstream, I would say perhaps the most easy way to identify that will be through digital identity. Because for some people, they still think metaverse as, uh, you know, like avatars moving around, whether or not they have legs, right, in Horizon World. So actually the metaverse, as Ahmed and, uh, you know, our colleagues at White Shield has already pointed out, it's more than just a gaming platform. It's really perhaps the extension of Web3, which where decentralization is at very center. So if in the future we can have our digital identity, which can be used seamlessly between the physical world we are in and the digital world we are in. And maybe that's not one metaverse. It can be multiple metaverse for different purposes. Some can be for healthcare, some can be for education and training, and some can be for public service of the smart city, et cetera. So if we have one digital identity, we can utilize for going through immigration control of different countries, as well as going through different world of metaverses. And now I think that's the time, perhaps it's an easy indicator to say metaverse has really arrived because there's no clear boundary between the life we are living in the physical world and the digital world we are living. Yeah. So it's just like the slide has pointed out that. So one digital identity can be utilized for different functions, whether it's healthcare, smart cities, telecommunications, e-governments, social platforms, e-commerce, humanitarian response, travels, food, financial services. So that's how I see that actually metaverse arrive, but I think it will take some time, at least 10 years, I would say, yeah. Maybe Dr. Christina, before jumping to the next, maybe just a quick follow-up question. What what do we actually need to do to see this digital identity? You know, they talk all the time about this interoperability, for example, to move from the you know platforms to platforms. Is it a question in terms of standard setting? Is it in terms of the technology? And and then what's the role of you know the government or private sector to to actually to, to actually push on this as you so succinctly or nicely mentioned about the digital identity? I think it's a very important question. And personally, I think we traditionally talking about public-private partnership, PPP. But uh, if we want to put people-centered in the equation and together with environment impact for the longer term, maybe the new term should call it public-private people-planet partnership. So that's 5P. And all of them need to come together to really ensure any kind of digital future we are creating now is really in line with the well-beings of our citizen as well as the well-beings of our planet. Because there has been lots of interesting research and basically saying that based on the current consumption behavior of ordinary people on this planet, we need another 2.5 Earth to you know sustain in the next 100 years. So clearly that's not easy to achieve unless we're thinking about emigrate to Mars like Elon Musk, etc. But in the short term, we need to thinking about how to create harmony between ourselves, between our cities, countries, and our planets. So I think that'll be the key. 
I think that fits into the next or the second question I have, you know, was which was about, you know, kind of this idea about this human centric, you know, metaverse and how do we actually realize this maybe a three or four P, you know, kind of analogy, but, but it'd be great maybe just to hear a little bit, you know, about this and how to make sure that we actually realize this as opposed to maybe some alternative scenarios, which maybe not as, um, not as desirable. Um, I think at this moment, we need to go back to the very basics and the basic facts at this moment, according to the latest research and statistics from the United Nations, that one third of the global population, they are still not connected with the internet. So that's a massive issue all of us need to address because we do not really want, there is a situation that some of us can benefit from the advancement of technology such as metaverse, digital twins, AI, where still one third of our population, they can't and they're, this kind of digital divide is even going any further, which is not good. But the great thing is we already have some solutions in place. So if we can go back to the previous slides um, about Elon Musk, a Starlink, lower orbit satellites, please. So what he has been doing is basically he's using a large number of smaller satellites <clears throat> to create the uh, broadband coverage in the world's most remote areas. And so far he has already covered, I think about 40 countries with one, I think two million you know, users already. So you know, it's making major progress, but we still have like another 2.8 billion population offline. So maybe we should encourage more private sectors and governments to enter into the space to create the IT infrastructure of connectivity in the first place, especially in Africa, in certain part of Asia, where I know um, DCO has a, a very strong presence for membership. So maybe that's something we can do together. So that's the first issue. And the next issue, if we can go to the next slide, please. Another issue is um, there has been a lot of debates about you know, whether or not the presence of metaverse is environmentally friendly or not. Some people will say the reduction of international travel, especially through airplane, using metaverse to have conference meetings, uh, interactions, is going to reduce massively on the environment cost. But on the other side, we know to run any kind of large simulations metaverse needs to have 24 seven, you know, consistent presence in the digital world. We need huge computing power as well as like data center to support that. So the carbon emission from that part is quite massive. And also there are e-waste to do with like all the different like wearables, you know, uh, VR goggles, air goggles, et cetera. So how can we make a balance? At this moment, there hasn't been any global analysis to look at the positive side and the negative side. So we need to maybe do that analysis to say how far we should push the technology for the well-being of human beings. Next slide, please. But at the same time, we all know there are some really exciting major breakthrough which had taken place uh, in Japan and the United States. So there is a paper published in Nature magazine, one of the most prestigious academic journal of the world this year, looking at uh, a new innovative nuclear fusion technology that can use non-radioactive um, materials to actually you know, produce electricity that can power the planet for another 10, 100,000 years. And uh, that's using this kind of technology to really have carbon emission free electricity. So I think there are a lot of very promising like technologies on the horizon we can utilize to address that, but we still need to have a more balanced debate. Next slide. And of course, there is a huge debate about um, the rise of AI, its uh, ethical considerations, et cetera, and the United Nations has just a point a high level advisory board on AI to working with all humanities to address how far should we really push that. And generative AI has actually become one of the most powerful building block of metaverse to have text 
to 3D avatars and text to 3D environments and text to 3D objects. So how generative AI is going to develop in the years to come will be very crucial to the human-centric metaverse development. And I recall uh, the godfather of AI, Dr. Geoffrey Hinter. He said in an interview with MIT Technology Review, and he said, I can have 10,000 neural networks, each having their own experience, and any of them can share what they learn instantly with the rest of them. And that's a huge difference. And we human beings can't do that. So he's a little bit worried that um, the machine can become a little bit smarter than the humans. So we might have some big issues here. So he resigned from Google and warning the whole human society that we need to have proper governance and framework put in place to ensure this is really ethical. Next slide. But again, I'm a very positive person. So I think even there is many, many issues we need to address. We need to see the positive side. There is already like very pragmatic solution in place. And uh, according to Elon Musk, uh, this gentleman is very forward looking, we know. And he basically believed that using brain computer interface can really address the issue of the rising you know, threats from AI. So what he has been doing is uh, he eventually gets FDA approval from the US government to start human trial in June this year. So he's actively looking for like uh, volunteers to do invasive like brain computer interface, basically putting a chips in your brain and uh, to cure all kinds of serious medical conditions like people who are paralyzed to help them to gain mobility again and people who are blind to help them to get vision and people who are suffering from loss of memory of like Alzheimer's disease, he can bring back memories for them, which is really positive. But he's not even the first person or companies doing that. And there is another company in the United States called Syndrome, and they were backed by Bill Gates, uh, as well as uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon to looking at non-invasive brain computer interface. So they are not using graphene a very advanced like material to put the sensors inside your blood vessel and then connect that with your nerves in the brain. And now using this technology, they have already helped people who are not able to speak to looking at their computer screen and use this kind of non-invasive brain computer interface to interact with their computer without even touching any, you know, a keyboard or mouse, which is amazing. But then in China, they are going even further. So at Tsinghua University, now what they have been doing is they have developed a very special new materials you can put into your inner ear, just like my pair earrings, you can see, you can put it there and uh, it can achieve the same kind of high quality, like, uh, you know, information exchange with your brain. So there is no even, like uh, no surgeries at all. So some people start to say this kind of non-invasive brain-computer interface can be the ultimate solution to metaverse interaction at scale for everyone to participate. You can do that 24-7 and it's quite immersive, natural, comfortable, and safe. And also it can solve the problem, as Elon Musk says, you know, address the issue of AI threats. So everything is moving very fast. Next slide. This is another thing I'm really interested because in, uh, a lot of discussion we are focusing now is very much on online safety. But we all know that the internet, a lot of things we are talking about now is only 5% called the clean web. So that's the one which we can you know, access through different search engines, say Google, Yahoo, Bing, et cetera. But actually underneath there is another 95% which is called deep web that's not really accessible through any of the you know, search engine we are doing on a daily basis. And among them, there is another 5% called deep web, which is full of criminal activities. So if we are saying, according to the white paper, that the metaverse is the next generation extension of Web3 of the decentralized internet, we shouldn't only focusing on the top five, which is 
you know, what we can see every day. What about the rest, 95% of the web, which are deep web or even dark web? So how do we address all this kind of like, uh, you know, criminal activities in other part of the web that we rarely see? I think that's a very interesting question. All of us need to work together to develop a solution. Next slides. And also, actually, the solution is already in place. So the UN Secretary General has established a very important framework called the Global Digital Compact for an open, free, and secure digital future for all. So all of the many different issues I have mentioned here is actually you know, being discussed at the top level between governments, private sectors. And the final result will be announced in a high-level conference in September next year. So I'm sure actually we can really utilize metaverse for the well-beings for everyone, just like the great work has already done by DCO and the uh, White Shield. Next slide. Okay, go back to you if you have any questions for me, Tom. Thanks, Dr. Christina. Um, I think very interesting to hear you know, about the, let's say the, 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 the transition and some of the challenges I think that we face with the human centric, um, you know, piece. I, I think it would be quite interesting, maybe just you know, quickly, even, you know, some of these cases, um, you know, practically that we're going to see where the metaverse will actually impact, um, you know, us and, and kind of ourselves, if you will. Um, so maybe it'd be quite interesting to hear just, just very briefly about those. And then, you know, what we'll do is we'll switch to Philippe and to see what are kind of these technical specifications actually needed to, you know, to realize some of this, um, you know, some of these, these particular developments, which you mentioned. Sure. If we go back to the slides, I can continue. I think there has been lots of discussion about how metaverse will really start to be more than a gaming environment. I think for ordinary citizens, if it's something to do with our own health, lifestyle, et cetera, that will be very powerful. So I would say in the next five years, perhaps the biggest opportunities for metaverse to really achieve mainstream, you know, like mass adoption, will need to start it at the individual user level, not necessarily through, say, the, you know, the affordability of AR or VR glasses but how actually we can use the digital twin of ourselves, the avatar, to have the opportunity to understand, you know, how we can live a happy, healthy life based on different like dietary or like uh, sleeping patterns or exercise patterns, et cetera. For example, if we can use the avatar created in the metaverse to link with our own health data, and it can tell me if I, try to free myself from any kind of junk food in the next five years. That's going to, you know, make me look like five years younger in 10 years time. That's the kind of impact I think a lot of consumers will be very interested. So I think that will be the first level because it's linked with predictive healthcare. And also another very important part we know for many different countries, a large portion of their healthcare budget is actually used to treat people with very serious conditions at terminal stage is hugely expensive. But if we change the whole, you know, paradigm into preventative and educate people to live much healthy and illness free, you know, it's good quality for people's life. That's what we call like people centered. And also another side is also saving huge amount of healthcare budget for government worldwide. They can utilize that to make people's life better and more satisfactory. So I would say that's the first layer. And maybe the second layer is how on the city and the country level we can use like uh, metaverse to help decision makers to make their cities more livable, sustainable, and participatory. And we know, for example, in Saudi Arabia, there is NEON project. There are many different infrastructure projects across Africa, across Europe, looking at how to make our city you know, more enjoyable by our citizen. So metaverse can play a very important part in that. And I'm currently chairing a working group in the United Nations ITU to looking at how we can create people-centered cityverse to ensure our citizen will really become the leading player 
in future developments of cities using Cityverse. And of course, on the top level, I will say the people, uh, planet, the planet elements is where we can use metaverse to simulate how we can fight climate change by creating a digital earth, you know, in the computer, which has already taken shape by the European Commission. So they are putting in 150 million euro to create a destination earth by 2030. So that will really allow us to see how metaverse related immersive technology can help us looking at different policy change, different behavior of individual citizens collectively to impact on the longer term on climate change of our world, how to fight a climate change using this immersive participatory technology. That'll be very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. And, and maybe, you know, Philippe, so we've heard a bit about, you know, some of the use cases, the overall development, but, you know, fundamentally for someone like me, you know, I've got my computer, I've got my mobile phone, you know, I've got a tablet, which I barely use, you know, how am I going to be able to access actually the metaverse? Is it through traditional devices? Is it through, um, you know, the brain implant, for example, that Dr. Christina mentioned, you know, from, from Neuralink? You know, it'd be good to, to hear a little bit about the, the actual the hardware needs, um, you know, to for, for you know, people to, to, in essence, access this. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, Dr. Christina has given us a very good glimpse at the future of how we'll be accessing the, the metaverse, but also the web at large. But maybe let me take a step back, bring it back to how we've been accessing the metaverse so far. And you know, what were the major impediments to the uptake of the metaverse? If I were to think of three main characteristics of the metaverse today, I would say that it is immersive, meaning it requires good human interfaces that allow us that immersive experience. It is interactive, meaning that it needs to react to us in real time and allow us to, re to interact in real time, even if we're sitting at two different ends of the world. And finally, it's extensive, meaning it can scale up to millions and billions of users in the future. And so looking at these characteristics, I would say that the, the current state of affairs is around wearables and specifically headsets. The best way today to experience the metaverse is through headsets. We've seen major investment happening at this level. I mean, Meta's acquisition of Oculus a while ago is a testimony to that. You can see the amount of investment that Meta keeps backing Oculus with. And you can see currently with uh, their, their new headset, the Headgear 2, that they've actually increased their sales tremendously over 2023. So while this has been traditionally a bit of, a, of, a, of an obstacle to access the metaverse, we can see more and more of an uptake. Now, speaking about headsets, you can see currently new trends as well. Um, you know, Apple had been notoriously outside this, uh, this universe itself, and right now they've upscaled the experience with the Apple Vision Pro. Um, oddly enough, in the launch of the Apple Vision Pro, Apple didn't mention the word metaverse at all. Instead, they coined the term spatial computing, and they showed us a lot of different use cases that obviously are outside the metaverse experience as we know it today, but apply very clearly to the metaverse. So will Apple be able to democratize headsets the same way they did with the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, and you know, the iWatch? This is really the, the question to be asked. But also we can see a broader set of devices coming on the market today. Um, as for example, the, the Meta Ray-Ban Stories eyeglasses. Now we're talking about the extended reality experience being core to the metaverse. And these glasses are not XR glasses in any way. They're neither augmented reality glasses, not even virtual reality glasses, but they bring in new use cases and they usher a new era of integrating technology with day-to-day -day eyewear. But also it's a first example 
of a tech giant Meta collaborating very closely with a fashion giant, in this case, uh, Luxottica Essilor, to bring to the market such, such devices. And this is definitely democratizing it. Now, we also see many players, mostly from China, going in with better and better equipment at lower and lower prices on a daily basis. Does that mean that the headset is going to be the only way to access the, uh, the metaverse? Definitely not. It's the most immersive experience, but it's also one of several ways. Today, you can access and experience the metaverse on your phone. And this is becoming more and more ubiquitous with um, companies like Google embedding AI in their new Tensor chip and many others following suit, especially most recently Qualcomm launching its latest Snapdragon chips, again, leapfrogging the, the competition on that front, or at least that's the current claim. We still need to see those in action. So more and more we're seeing um, the ability to better interact and better visualize push to the edge to the handset itself. And I believe we're going to see more usage of handsets, meaning of smartphones to access the metaverse. Um, so, I'm not discounting finally the use of laptops and most importantly, high performance gaming laptops to, to access the metaverse specifically for richer gaming experience or visual experiences per se. But for now, I think we're going to see a major uptake of smartphones in terms of day-to-day -day usage for the metaverse while the headsets and eventually maybe the, the brain chip or the ear chip take, take over very quickly. And so, thank so, you, Dr. Christina, for showing these. So, so, so Philippe, maybe, you, you know, hardware itself, you know, is obviously only as good as in terms of the network and the computational power, you know, behind it, if you will. And we know at least that there are huge demands in terms of networks, in terms of, uh, both in terms of, you know, a bandwidth needed, uh, latency issues um, on, on one side, um, and then as well the computational, um, you know, capabilities to actually deliver these new virtual worlds. Can you even just talk, maybe just in a couple of minutes, you know, what is the infrastructure, you know, requirements, the digital infrastructure requirements that are needed, and how close, you know, are we to actually delivering on some of these, you know, virtual worlds and these, um, you know, real-world rendering uh, processes? If you will? That's a very good question. Thank you, Tom. Well, maybe we should look at the, the metaverse in layers indeed. And this is something that Ahmed showed us earlier. Maybe I'll focus on three different aspects and you know, I'll, I'll extract three layers from the, the six layer model that Ahmed has shown us. And one of them is of course, the human interface that we spoke about just now, but as you rightly said, there, there's more to it. So going down one layer, going one layer deeper, into the metaverse, I would talk about the automation and decentralization there. So I would talk about the role, the, the core role of AI for automation of the experience for the interactivity with human and non-human proponents in the metaverse. And I would talk about blockchain, which is the core building entity, if you will, of, of the metaverse and the decentralized world that it's providing which allows us to operate our identity within the metaverse to validate our identity, if you will, and to, to carry our non-fungible tokens across, the, across the, the metaverse itself. So maybe if we talk about those, and then we talk about a third layer, which is the infrastructure layer. And at that point, maybe I'll talk about two elements of that infrastructure. One is the sheer compute power that we need with the metaverse, with that interactive rich experience that it's providing. And two is the delivery of that compute power. So the connectivity that we're providing between the end user, the metaverse, the multiverses that are out there and the various other end users. So I talk about you know, the, the data center world and the compute power. Is it still centralized or is it being pushed to the edge? And we talk about the sheer broadband capabilities that are required to connect, especially in a mobile world today. So maybe I'll start with the, the technologies 
the software technologies that allow us to experience the metaverse. And most importantly for me, and one of the, the biggest types of 2023 is AI and its potential for, for automation. We, we've seen a major hype since generative AI came to, to market and that offering became um, quite public. So on the technology side of things, Gen AI and AI in general means the proliferation of GPU hungry data centers. So we're no longer talking about the traditional hardware architectures that we've seen throughout since the 80s all the way to the early 2000s, but we're talking about more GPU hungry types of data centers. And we're seeing that race for the AI embedded CPUs, as I just mentioned, you know, Google with its latest uh, tensor chip, pushing AI as in, you know, AI ready and AI embedded into their chip and Qualcomm with the latest iteration of their Snapdragon chip. Now, these are quite interesting, but I think that the, the most interesting latest development on that front would be IBM's announcement of an AI enabled CPU that abstracts the need for strong GPU power to be able to recreate AI and a, a rich environment, if you will, within the metaverse. I think this is a, a good sign of someone trying to leapfrog the competition and creating a, a broader channel, if you will, of technologies that we can rely on. Now, having said that on AI, let me move to, to blockchain. I'm, I don't have much to say here because the, the ubiquity of blockchain is, is all around us. We've seen blockchain adopted for over a decade with you know, the, the Bitcoin and all the altcoins out there. We've seen real life use cases established beyond a, a crypto coin or cryptocurrency with traceability, with, uh, and we've seen this across the board. We've seen it in agriculture, in, in the food industry, in finance, in logistics, we've seen it everywhere and it's starting to become a reality across the board. However, where we've seen it advance really the fastest is in the metaverse. We've seen massively rapid uptake and we've seen a diversity of use cases that has gone way beyond the real life. So in the metaverse, the, uh, the usage of NFTs has taken up super rapidly, I would say. I, we haven't seen anything take off that quickly uh, since, I would say, or until the, the advent of Gen AI. And most importantly, I would say from a, a blockchain perspective, we've seen the use cases of self-sovereign identity come across the metaverse. And we now see the importance of validation of identity and control of identity and own information. So with that said, on the, the first layer of depth of the metaverse, if you will, the software layer, maybe we can move on to a more tangible layer, which is the, the physical infrastructure. So and maybe Philippe, it'd be good, maybe just even touch on maybe one or two points. Um, you know, it'd be quite good to hear about the physical. And then let's switch in as well with Ahmed, even just a couple of remarks then about, you know, the, the role of international standard, international organizations, you know, within this from, from what Dr. Christina and Philippe have mentioned about blockchain decentralization, you know, and, and how some of these standards can actually support this. So maybe Philippe, even just a, a word or two quickly about infrastructure would be great. And then we can, that'll lead into... Uh, maybe some of the final remarks before we switch to questions. Certainly. So two things about the infrastructure. The first is that massive compute power to enable the, the seamless experience. And that takes us to the world of, of data centers. Are we still looking at building larger and larger data centers that are centralized in global data hubs? Or are we looking at pushing to edge data centers that are smaller, closer to the end user and more distributed across. I think we're seeing more and more a case for the latter nowadays. Um, in terms of the delivery, we're looking at moving from you know, a, a 10 megabit internet experience that, that we're used to, 
to the need for a hundred megabit experience? Does that need does that mean that the operators need to build networks that are ten times faster? Does it mean that they need to invest ten times more in their network topology? Uh, that's definitely not the answer, and that's not going to happen. But the the interesting road here is the, the road to mobility with the advent of 5G and 6G on the horizon. This is where we feel the difference is going to happen. Um, so this is it in, in short, and we can talk a bit more about the, the regulation needed around this or the, the policies that will enable that. And I think this is where I hand it back to Ahmed. Right. And maybe Ahmed, even just a minute or two you know, about the role, and Philippe started to touch on this point, you know, what are, what's the role of international organizations, you know, to promote either in terms of common standards, um, to promote, you know, accessibility, um, if you will be great to hear. And then two, you know, we talk about, you know, COP28 is coming up, you know, there's uh, sustainable development goals. It, what's the role of, of metaverse as well to support, you know, the, the development of, of metaverse to actually accelerate or to push forward, you know, achieving some of these. So even, a, you know, a minute or so would be would be great just to hear your your thoughts about this before we at least, you know, able to get to some questions. Well, thank you, Fong. Uh, uh, no pressures. Uh, we represent, uh, I represent the international organization, and I see all these discussions going around uh, the role of collaboration, cooperation that could be facilitated through the international organization is key. Uh, we cannot afford to have those that, that, that nationalistic or regional approach, approach to policies and regulations that, uh, anymore. Uh, so I, I think the role of international organizations is important or key. And it is multifaceted uh, because these organizations are the means of the global multilateral cooperation and the, these types of dialogues uh, around around safe digital future for all. Uh, I have I think uh, there are many points where international cooperation is 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 needed, uh, but uh, I think I think I've mentioned uh, I've uh, shortlisted four of those. Uh, number one is the effective governance of 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 internet or web3 or metaverse uh, as we say it um, so we have had a few experiments around governing the internet in the, in the last two decades there have been some lessons learned um, and we have made some mistakes so uh, there it's, especially when we talk about the competition aspects of it and that and uh, the, the whole debate about the, the, the technology big technology companies absorbing uh, the, the the small startups etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think we need to get the governance right and that is where international organizations can play a key role in it so we need to develop or agree on principle based frameworks uh, that would make metaverse and whatever iteration of the of the web uh, it is uh, to be safe, open, accessible, inclusive, competitive. Um, uh, there's there's a, there's a uh, emphasis on that and human centric. Uh, and 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 we need that because we need to foster innovation and we need to protect people and society from any potential harms uh, that may come uh, out of the emerging technologies. So that's number one. Uh, the other thing, okay, so uh, what we have been able to do well and very well is uh, interoperability. So we have worked and uh, we have worked on the standardization. We have worked on different te technologies being able to uh, uh, interoper uh, interoperate with each other. I think we need to continue that, but we, have, we are under, un under immense pressure now uh, because the innovation now is super fast. Um, and it's very sporadic, uh, metaverse or metaverses or, you know, a whole iterations of, of, of AIs. So we need to double down our collective efforts uh, and we cannot miss the chance of, uh, uh, of, of having, having metaverses or metaverse or whatever we call it, uh, interoperable. And uh, the international organizations like ITU are already doing some work on standardization. Uh, that's, that's, that's number two. Number three is access and inclusivity. We need to work together, uh, orchest orchestrated uh, by the multilateral organizations, uh, that the metaverse access is not restricted to specific regions or demographies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we need to bridge the digital divide. We need to uh, make uh, 
um, the broadband access um, affordable and we need to promote uh, inclusivity. And the third, fourth point, which will lead to your next question, uh, Tom, is about sustainability. So we have a collective responsibility to ensure that while fulfilling our current growth ambitions, we do not jeopardize the interests of our future generations and the planet. Uh, and we will have to join hands um, uh, and international organizations have a key role to play to fulfill this responsibility while making a good progress towards uh, our digital future. Uh, this now takes me, uh, I, I'll take a minute to, uh, to give you a few examples on how metaverse and the emerging technologies can help achieve some of the sustainability goals or SDGs. So we've seen, um, uh, we, we've seen the slide from Christina where, it, uh, where, where we have uh, concerns about the sustainability and the compute power that all these emer emer uh, emerging technologies are going to uh, consume. Uh, but on the brighter, brighter side, uh, I think Metaverse can help as an enabler to make good progress on the SDGs, for example. So we have healthcare and education, and education. We've explored some of those use cases, uh, Metaverse use cases, where uh, we can enhance um, uh, the performance on the SDGs that are related to healthcare and well-being and quality education, SDG 3 and SDG 4. Uh, the enhanced community engagement that could be powered by Metaverse uh, can support the, the, the SDG 11 on sustainable cities. Uh, efficient public services uh, can be provided effectively through Metaverse. And there's a very interesting example of Colombia where the first court hearing happened in Metaverse and the, and the participants, uh, they, they appeared as avatars. And so there's that. Yeah, so uh, and, and then Metaverse can play a key role in, uh, in, in, in uh, addressing some of the global challenges, uh, including so, uh, social exclusion and inequality that contributes toward SDGs five and 10. I have a long list, but I think uh, um, uh, being conscious of the time, uh, I stopped here and I think I've, uh, I've, I've answered the two questions that you have uh, uh, posted to, uh, towards me, Tom. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, maybe let's take even five more minutes since we started a, a few minutes late and we can go through some of the, you know, kind of the questions. I see that there's more, more and more, um, um, you know, kind of questions uh, starting to starting to come in. Um, so, so maybe, and I'll, I'll to select maybe a few, and particularly about topics maybe that we haven't necessarily touched on, you know, as as much, or 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 or, or maybe to highlight at least a couple of pieces. So there's a question from uh, uh, Radwa and then Michael, um, actually about you know copyright infringement, intellectual property rights, you know plagiarism, and then the question in terms of the digital twin um, with privacy, you know, implications, um, and you know obviously with the personal data involved. And I think ultimately, what sort of privacy technologies or policies, you know, should we be actually be looking at uh, to address, um, you know, whether it be in terms of international organizations, um, you know, Ahmed, as you mentioned, or maybe Dr. Christina, when you mentioned in terms of digital twins, what either technologies or policies, you know, could be to support, you know, that. So maybe at Dr. Christina, if you want to take a, if you'd like to at least touch on that point from the digital twin you know, perspective could be quite interesting because I'm sure that this is a topic on, on people's minds as to what this actually means for intellectual property, privacy, and so on and so forth, and what what, what we need to do to address that. Yeah, definitely. I, I think the IP issue is particularly important at this moment. As I mentioned that um, at this moment, a large number of like metaverse components is being massively produced through generative AI. And uh, there is already a huge amount of controversies and debates on how to legislate around generative AI created like intellectual property rights. At this moment, worldwide, no country actually allow AI to become the owner or creator of any IP except in South Africa. There has been one particular case filed by a US inventor with a generative AI machine. So that's already caused massive debates on whether or not they should be allowed in other part of the world because imagine in the future when more than 50% of the contents every one of us consume on a daily basis is generated through generative AI. So who should own that IP? Would this IP go go back to the producer of the generative AI, the engineer who trained AI to do the image 3D models, or should that attribute back to the many, many millions of images 
human creator have you know produced to train that AI? Or should the company who employ that engineer, you know, pay for their salaries to own the IP? It's going to be massively, massively, you know, debatable. And I know the word intellectual property organization WIPO is looking at this now, but uh, it's very challenging. So I think maybe that can be an area for international collaboration moving forward because or else no one wants to use generative AI to create any kind of, you know, work in the future because there's no IP protection. So that's going to be very problematic, either, you know, within metaverse environments or when it goes to digital twin. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you for this, um, um, uh, Dr. Christina. So, so maybe a question related to, um, you know, society. And, and there's two actually questions kind of associated with that um, from Olitan and, 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 and Radwa, you know, about society, social interactions and how things are changing with the rise of the metaverse. So I, Dr. Christina, you mentioned kind of Second Life, for example, you know, that there's obviously then you know, there's massive, you know, EVE Online and a whole host of different, um, you know, platforms in essence for these new social dynamics, um, you know, to, to, to play out, if you will. Um, it'd be interesting to hear, maybe Ahmed, I'm not sure if you've had a thought a bit about this as well, a bit in terms of Philippe, as to how you actually see or how we see actually societies, you know, changing a little bit with regard to this and how we could see this as well, um, you know, within the future. Yeah, well, uh, I think a, a couple of quick thoughts. So, I mean, a lot of work that we do at an international organization is uh, looking at the cross-jurisdictional nature of the digital economy. Uh, and the societies as we we as we know them today, they are they are closed, they are conserved. The countries have their, uh, their 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 geographical boundaries. They keep them quite tight to themselves, right? So if we are if we are entering a metaverse world, which where uh, all the features are, and all the transactions happen in a virtual world, and there are no borders, there wouldn't be. Uh, and the, the cultural and society, societal norms and compulsions are not going to be a, 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 a part of, of a part of uh, uh, this, 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 these virtual worlds. Uh, it's going to be, uh, I think, it's going to put a lot of challenges towards the norms that we as humans are used to or, or we are aware of. Again, it would, it's going to be a curious case. And uh, if you think of certain values. Or certain uh, certain principles that have that have traditionally been not acceptable in certain parts of the, parts of the world or certain societies, uh, being being subject uh, being subject to uh, you know and, and opening up uh, would have both you know risks and challenges and opportunities as well. So it can help us to evolve towards a more global society. Yet there are many nuances uh, that would that would just come, and then we we'll see how do we need to address those challenges. Thank you. Maybe we'll do a couple more questions. We'll do it a, a quick, a quick, a rapid, a rapid, a rapid a kind of way. And one, Philippe, I actually want to somewhat direct um, to you. Um, so talks a bit about accessibility from uh, to Monday, for example, from Canada. You know, under people in underdeveloped countries engage with metaverse. It talks explicitly about skills. But maybe to frame it around, you know, the technology needs. So you articulated quite extensively about, you know, the the, the technological and you know network and compute upgrades. How can we ensure access um, for for people um, within different uh, locations, or maybe they don't have access to such, you know, kind of the rapid uh, rapid or, or com computational power? I'll give you uh, one minute, though, so we'll we'll go through this quickly. All right. But I would say we, I'm less worried about the computation power than I am about the connectivity. In uh, underdeveloped countries, I think connectivity is, is currently the, uh, the main challenge. Now, with, the, um, with more and more satellite coverage coming in, and Dr. Christina gave us the example of Starlink, but also there are others, I would say within the next decade, we should see a democratization of this type of access to the point where the price point drops enough for this sort of satellite access to be available at very low prices in underdeveloped areas and across all countries. The focus is specifically on underdeveloped areas and whether it's um, you know, hot air balloons or satellites, there should be a way to cover large areas at a, a decent price point. When it comes to compute power, as I said, more and more 
computer virus being pushed into devices and soon there wouldn't be the need to pay for an expensive high-end device to be able to gain access to a good chipset that allows embedded AI functionalities that allows good visualization and rendering. So my idea is that this will happen through mobile devices with the help of better connectivity in underserved areas. And maybe we'll do one last question. Um, and maybe Dr. Christina, maybe I'll direct this one to you. It's, when we talk about human-centric and how to make you know, the metaverse a human-centric place, this is from Oyen from Nigeria. Um, so this was referring to the gender disparities, the digital divide. You know, how can women leverage you know, the emerging metaverse you know, to, to address these inequalities and, and gain or you know, to, to, to access you know, opportunities for employment? Um, so maybe just even a quick minute um, um, so we can end it on, on, on that note. I, I think the most important thing is really education. How can we have government to provide more funding to support girls to go into STEM subjects, study very early, and also to give them the confidence that they can become any kind of you know leader in all kinds of industry, whether it's prime minister of country or the next Nobel Prize winners in chemistry, or they can be the next billionaires. So they should be educated in the same way, like when I visit, visit like Buckingham Palace to looking at how Queen Victoria was educated in the first place. So she has confidence to become the best she can in her chosen field. I think that's most crucial for all our society to address gender equality. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think with that, unless Ahmed, um, Leap, any other last comments? Oh, we've got the 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 challenge of the metaverse challenge. Oh, great! So many actually uh, answers uh, to this one. So it looks like at least within first place, uh, content regulation um, as the main challenge and complication of the metaverse. I think that as well touches on a couple of the different questions, um, you know, lately or tangentially in terms of intellectual property, so on and so forth that we're going to look at. User accessibility, um, you know, the second one, it looks like interoperability at uh, at least in the third. And then, of course, you know, some others. So quite interesting to see at least where um, where people are starting to see where, where where some of these challenges are. And then obviously then where we need to look and address, um, you know, potential policy uh, solutions and intervention, if you will. Um, with that, unless any other final words from our panelists. Um, yeah, I would just make I, I would just uh, make one one statement towards the end of it, and uh, it is so we've we've addressed and we have we have explored the different challenges and opportunities, uh, but I think we believe that these challenges can only be effectively addressed uh, through a multilateral and multi-stakeholder collaboration, uh, and the human-centric development of web metaverse uh, is is at the core of it, um, and the policy making has to be all inclusive. Uh, that's the closing uh, sentence from me. Well, thank you all. We appreciate, I think, the time. Um, we appreciate the attendance. Appreciate the great questions. Um, we hope, obviously, that this session was uh, as informative and, and entertaining, I think, as it was, um, you know, for us. Um, great to experience and exchange some of the ideas in terms of the, you know, the paper itself. Uh, thank you, of course, to the panelists. I um, really appreciate it. Appreciate you know your thoughts, expertise, and you know, obviously dialogue about some of these issues. And with that, maybe we end the session. Thank you all. Thank and you. Please read our, uh, please read our uh, white paper and uh, please reach out to us uh, if you have any questions, any further discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.